My name is Ben Jury. I'm an account manager on the UK and Ireland team at Turnitin. I'm sure I've had the pleasure of working with many people on the session today. So a special welcome to you all. We're also joined by Namra Ananda, our Senior Product Marketing Manager. We've got Gailey Nelson, our Senior Director of Product Management. And we've got Zach Bennett, one of our distinguished machine learning scientists here at Turnitin. So without further ado, I'm going to let Namreta jump in. Thanks, Ben, for the introductions. Uh, before we get into Turnitin's AI writing detection feature that you really want to hear about, I wanted to take a couple of minutes to just take you through uh, what the guiding principles are uh, based on which uh, you know, we determine how, how to apply AI across our products. Uh, so the first one, uh, Ben, you can just click so we can. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so working our work with AI furthers one of Turnitin's main missions, which is to ensure that uh, institutions, the educators, uh, students um, have access or, or the power to make data-driven decisions, uh, which promote academic integrity as well as further um, improve learning outcomes. Uh, secondly, we understand that by using or training our model on large sets of data, what we can do essentially is mitigate the impact of unintended biases. So that, that is key for us. Um, then we also uh, routinely get our customers or involve our customers uh, in helping us uh, test different features and products before we actually take them to market. And then we use a lot of their feedback to further enhance, uh, you know, or uh, develop our products. And, and that's not, uh, you know, basically what we are trying to do here uh, with AI as well is not just limit the testing and development only based on engineering and our scientists feedback, but we'd like to get the market or the people we develop it for uh, to, to, you know, be key stakeholders on and partner with us on how or the path that it's going to take the product basically. Um, then uh, when we talk about how AI uh, is, you know, is tailored. So we know that when, uh, when training our AI on academic use cases, it helps us hone a more uh, generic or more general AI approach and, and turn it into a very specific way in which education intersects with AI. So helping uh, the education industry address, uh, you know, um, uh, address any challenges related to AI specifically. Um, Again, we understand that privacy and data security are key. We, we understand how important it is for our customers. And Turnitin's uh, data security policies basically uh, cover all our products, including anything uh, that's based on AI. So your data is safe and we at, at no point in time would that be shared with third parties without your knowledge or without uh, getting express approvals, sharing it even within uh, your institution is, is very caveated. Uh, then we also understand that any tool that we built, whether it's AI or whether it's, uh, you know, any of the other engineering tools we built, it needs to be rigorously tested. So when I speak, I know that uh, our AI and QA teams are actually currently as well testing different scenarios where AI is involved to ensure that the tools and the solutions we provide to you um, meet meet the standards that you're, that you're used to and meets the efficacy and accuracy levels that, that we have promised you. Um, and again, when talking about human in the loop approach, what we are trying to say here is uh, it's based on the understanding that by combining the human element with, uh, you know, uh, machine learning, we are able to do so much more than we would be able to if we were to individually look at different aspects, separate human from the machine. And last uh, but not the least is that we understand that AI is constantly learning and developing. And so is Turnitin's technology, be it AI or not. So to ensure that we are always ahead of the market and we are able to address our customers' needs as of now in the current time. Um, one of, um, in, in a, sorry, in a recent survey done by um, Educos, uh, one of the statistics that were shared with us was that 75% of the respondents believe that academic integrity would be the most impacted um, with the rise of generative AI. And this is a sentiment that was shared with us across, like not, not just with the, what we heard from Educos, but also when we spoke to a lot of customers, including our customer advisory board. And this is one of the main reasons why we decided to, um, you know, um, sort of bring forward uh, our AI writing detection feature launch. Basically, we were already developing uh, AI writing detection even before ChatGPT was launched in uh, November last year. But when, when we heard how 
how this was affecting you know uh, all educators and they needed a tool that could at least help them understand when um, AI was used in any submission. We decided to share with you the preview of our um, AI writing detection as early as uh, April this year. Um, and when, sorry, Ben, next slide. Yeah, and and when um, I mean this is this is how you currently see AI writing detection in you know accounts that have uh, cho selected to enable AI writing detection. Um, as you're already aware, a, uh, AI writing detection has been launched uh, along with your similarity as uh, you know as part of your similarity report workflow. So what this essentially means that when um, you submit uh, a document to Turnitin while it's being processed for similarity checking, it's also processing for AI detection. And when you open the AI, uh, sorry, when you open the similarity report, you will see this new button that now surfaces, the, the highlighted AI indicator, which basically shows the percentage of um, AI writing that our uh, model uh, deems to have been you know, written by an AI writing tool. Now, this percentage is completely independent of the similarity score that you see on top. Uh, when you click the AI indicator, uh, it will take you to the AI report. The AI report opens as a separate tab to the similarity report and provides, uh, you know, details on where uh, we think or where the model thinks uh, the AI writing might have been yeah, used. So here, when you see the highlighted segments, those are se segments that are model things were written by an AI tool and not uh, human written. And on the right hand panel, you will see the same percentage that the AI indicator shows. And along with it, we've also linked to a lot of useful resources, basically to help you understand how uh, AI writing detection works for Turnitin. So there's the link to the FAQ page that answers questions around how the model works, um, what's the scope of detection, how you can use it, et cetera. And then in the second segment, you will see a lot of pedagogical resources that we've created to help educators like you um, have uh, these conversations in your classroom to, to you know, help you uh, maybe uh, develop assessments that may prevent or may restrict the use of AI writing tools, or just have when you you know uh, when when addressing false positives, what would be the best way to have that conversation with students? So so those uh, links provide you a lot of guidance on how these conversations etc can be had, and Gaylene will provide you know provide further insight into how these can be used in in the upcoming slides. And now I'd just like to pass it to Zach so he can take you through the actual AI model that we use. Thanks, Namrata. Um... Yeah, uh, thank you everyone for uh, calling in today. I appreciate all the attention and, and concern you have for this topic. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk about some concerns. Hopefully uh, this will alleviate some of the questions that you uh, have about our product. Um, the first thing I wanna say is we've been working on this uh, for a couple of years now. Uh, when GPT-3 was released in 2020, that was really when it popped up on our radar. And in early 2021 is when we first started an actual um, internal project to address this, where we were collecting open source student data. We were downloading these models. We were testing with them. We were trying to learn about what AI generated text looks like and how to differentiate it from student writing. So we really had a long history when chat GPT exploded on the scene in, in uh, November. And we that's one reason why we were able to uh, release an effective product so quickly. Um, so regarding our training and testing, I wanna specifically answer some questions. First of all, no student writing is sent to third party tools like OpenAI, who hosts GPT 3.5 and GPT 4 and Chat GPT. Uh, we don't send anything to BARD. We don't send anything to Quillbot. All student writing is kept on our premises and under our control. So we're, there's no chance of data privacy concerns or anything in that regard. Um, we only use small pieces of writing for training, we don't use entire submissions. So we extract uh, little snippets of student writing that have no personal information in them whatsoever. And that's what we train to use, or we use to train the models. Our AI is uh, what's called a classifier. Um, the output of the model uh, that we use to detect AI writing is just a number, basically a probability whether something is uh, AI written or whether it was human written. So it's not a text generator the way you hear about like these other tools like chat GPT. So there's no possibility of any of the training data that we use being leaked in any way. Um, the only thing that that model gives us is, a, is the number that we use in the product. Uh, we have a very large repository that we use for periodic testing. We wanna make sure that 
the tool is uh, safe and effective. Um, so we have over 800,000 documents that we use um, that were uh, submitted before the release of text generators so that we know there's no uh, AI writing in them whatsoever. And that's what we used to verify that our false positive rate is extremely low. Um, last thing I'll say is our solution is customized for academic writing. It's meant to be used within the bounds of academic writing. Uh, it's not a general AI detector. And uh, this is where our experience really helps us. We've got 20 years as a company looking at student writing and understanding um, how students write, what assignments look like. We have other tools that guide students through writing process like our revision assistant tool. So we have a long history of using AI to help students write. And really that experience is what um, helped us bring a really effective product to market. So next slide. Now, a little bit of uh, detail about how our model currently works. And I say currently because this could change in the future if we find a more effective way of doing it. But what we have is what's called a block predictor. And that's the AI model I referred to earlier. And basically it takes chunks of text, like 300 words or so, and it runs it through the detector. And then out of that, you get a probability from the model, whether that block was written by a human or whether it was written by AI. And we scan through documents, we use overlap, overlapping blocks, and we build up a series of results from that that we then aggregate into a sentence level prediction. So a sentence may appear in multiple blocks and the, the sentence score ends up being sort of an average, you can think of it that way, of the blocks that it belonged to when we ran it through the detector. So what this does, this moving window gives us a pretty effective way of finding concentrations of AI writing. What it does mean is around the borders, we may be a little less sure. So when we start to look at things like our sentence false positive rate, we're not as sure when you're looking at the transition from human to AI writing. But generally speaking, if you see a really strong block highlighted in our product, then we're very confident um, that that was written by AI. And that's it. I'll hand this over now to Galene. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Uh, nice to see all of you. And I, I, I echo Zach's sentiments. Thanks for spending some time with us this afternoon. And hopefully um, we're able to answer some questions that you have. I, I know that there'll be several that we need to take away from this large audience, but um, hang in there. We'll get some responses to you shortly. So uh, one of the things we we wanted to share out with you, we've been monitoring our usage, obviously, since we launched in, in April. And since then, we have we have processed a little over 38 point, well, 30, well, it's probably more than that, but as of the stats from late last week was 38 million submissions um, through our AI chat, or sorry, AI detector. And um, some of our key metrics that we're monitoring is what, what areas of, of the document are being processed and at what level levels for AI. So what we're seeing now is about 3.5% of all of the documents that we processed are showing um, more than 80% AI generated text. And next slide. The next one is above 20%. So where we're, our cutoff at this point is around 20% above. Uh, we're seeing about 9.6% of documents of those 38.5 million submissions um, that have a high probability of, of AI te generated text. And the last slide. And then we're seeing our we're also seeing that with our testing as well, real world testing as well as um, uh, as well as our lab testing, still we're very confident that we have a less than one percent rate of false positives for anything that's more than twenty percent AI um, or more yeah more than reporting more than twenty percent AI generated text. So this leads us to the next part of the conversation. Um, so. Following our, our commitment to our AI guidelines and what we're trying to, to do in delivering something that is a uh, that is a helpful tool, but a safe tool, and reflecting on those guiding principles, um, we are doing everything that we can to ensure that there is a, we continue to have a low, less than 1% false positive rate. So we have had a recent release where we're addressing a few of those things. Um, we have discovered that we are seeing some inconsistent results with uh, documents that are reporting less than 20% AI writing. So the false positive rate seems a little bit wobbly between those numbers. So we have added an indicator uh, in our, we're an asterisk to our indicator to let you know that that's, a, that's probably not a, a, a rate that you want to spend a whole lot of time on because we can't actually 
give you a, or find a consistent um, report for that one. So anything below 20%, we're still detecting a higher than what we'd like to have as a false positive rate, but it might still be worthy having a conversation with a student. Um, the other thing that we've we've addressed is uh, adding a few more words to our model or our testing actually helps us to find better um, language pairs for our, our um, model results. So we've upped the minimum word requirement for our documents, which we're typically using uh, long form documents um, and testing for those from 150 to a minimum of 300 words. And then um, we'll, we're also, depending on how the, it's written, we're also, we also changed how we aggregate the sentences at the beginning, which typically represents the introduction, and those are fairly common, as well as the conclusion at the end of the paper. So we've changed how we are aggregating those so that we can continue to maintain a high rate of, of accuracy and a low rate of, of false positives. All right, so the next one, so we know these conversations are really difficult for both instructors and students. And so we are super fortunate to have a group of, of former instructors who actually work at Trinidad who help us develop content and resource materials that we can provide not only in seminars like this, but also in um, to customers and in to develop your own training materials. And some of those guides are, are targeted toward instructors. Some of those are in, in, uh, admins and some of those guides are targeted towards students. So this first range, and we have uh, we have links to all of these, but this first range is really helping instructors navigate those really challenging discussions around how to talk to a student about potential AI misuse. How do I talk to them when we know is a false positive? Because that's a that's a fairly scary conversation to have, and I see a lot of questions in the Q and A about that. And then, what are some of the conversation starters around AI where you do have a high degree of confidence that the student has actually used something to generate the text, and it wasn't a human written document? This one for students, we have very similar resources for them. How do you, how do you need to, what do you need to know about false positive and what do you need to do to prevent being caught up in that false positive rate? Many times they're just accidental. Uh, students don't realize what they're doing. They, they copy something or they think they have changed enough. Um, they think they have submitted their own work document, but they, maybe they submitted something that had uh, content from, you know, Grammarly or, or uh, Quillbot or even ChatGPT. So how do you have those conversations about understanding what an acceptable use, the acceptable use policy is for your institution and how do you need to, how do you need, what do you need to do to make sure that you're compliant with that? The other guide is around use of AI to avoid the appearance of misconduct, a little bit similar, but where your institution approves more of an acceptable use um, uh, guidelines and, and policies, how do you make sure that you're staying within those guardrails? So those are, we have a checklist for students to, to leverage um, to think about how they might use that in an ethical way. Um, a couple of things that are coming in the roadmap. So we we did release our first preview in, in April. We had a second update to that to address um, some changes in how we are detecting the, the AI writing and, and improving that model. Um, what's coming up next is the ability to have a downloadable PDF report so that that document can be, that report can be shared um, with students or whomever uh, as an instructor you wish to share that with. You do have to click through the, the, the preview indicator to be able to get to um, the report itself to be able to download it, but it will be there for you once we have that release. We're also working on AI writing statistics. So one of the more common questions that come back from our customers is, how much AI is happening in my institution? Um, that's a pretty high level uh, conversation to have and a pretty high level set of metrics and statistics. We're also looking at the instructor level. What are some of the things that you are looking for as instructors to help you understand, you know, what are the signals I should should be looking for how should I be um, how should I be aware of what's happening in my classroom and what does that heat map look like am I seeing this sort of pop up all over the place a conversation I had with an instructor at, at a university in in um, the U.S. last week he said he sees a massive explosion of the use of uh, AI tools and generating text and he said you know the, the biggest concern he has is how do I figure out where, the, where to pinpoint the problem and, and where to go to address it? And he sees these tools as, as helpful to start a conversation, not necessarily 
pointing a finger at anything because our tools don't imply intent, but really helpful to understand where should we have these conversations around acceptable use, around what good looks like and around what we have, um, what kind of tools are available for writing. And then finally, the reference, or oh, sorry, last one in there. One more, the reference validator. So this is a feature that we have in exploration right now and build the ability to look at references and citations within a document and determine whether or not these are um, these are references that have been used before. Future versions will look for are these valid references. We know that the vast majority, well, I guess not the vast majority, but a good portion and probably more than half of citations um, that are delivered through AI writing tools um, are are artificial. They have been they have been generated, and they are not necessarily um, even valid links. So our ability to be able to point those out for you would be very helpful. All right. So that's what I'm so coming. That's on a roadmap, and I'll pass it back to Ben to tell you how to you can test the feature. Thanks so much, Gaylene, and thanks very much, Namra, uh, and also Zach uh, for your insights there. I'm sure we'll circle back to all of you uh, during the Q&A as well. But to finish it off, I'm going to run you through uh, some of the more uh, practical um, sides of this. So obviously in the build up, you know, in, before the release, having conversations with um, with customers, I understand it, you know, it's a very, it's a large change and there's a lot to, a lot to get our heads around. And ultimately, you know, we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're in this together. And, you know, I understand as well in terms of, you know, universities needing time to sort of build out policies around this and ultimately you know anything that could affect um policy might take a bit longer to to deploy so we want to be able to help you you know ultimately be able to test this feature so so you're able to understand it you know before before implementing so essentially uh, from may we built a tool that allows the admins to um you know, to be able to access this this feature to, to do testing. So essentially how this works on a practical level is it can now be, the AI detection tool can now be toggled on or off at an account level, but it can also be toggled on and off at a sub-account level. So for example, if you were using, just using the website, for example, it'd just be a case of setting up a, a sub-account um, for, for this testing purpose keeping the AI toggle on, on that sub account, and then you'd be able to do your testing while AI is disabled on your main account. Now, if you were using it through an integration, it'd be very, very similar. It would just be a case of, you know, keeping the main, keeping the toggle off on your main account that's connected to your, to your live environment, where you could also create the sub account, link that to any VLA staging and have that toggled on. So essentially allowing you to do the testing within the, you know, within your, your LMS as well. So this functionality uh, for, was it, is, you know, has been out since May. Uh, this, the example I've given there is for Feedback Studio customers, which I believe will make up the, the majority. And as account managers, we can work with you on this, uh, you know, to ultimately help you sort of navigate these steps. So just reach out to your account manager and we can help guide you through uh, this process. Slightly different for any similarity or originality customers only. For these customers, uh, what we can do is we can actually set up um, a separate test account um, for this purpose. Uh, these test accounts would expire after 90 days, but again, we can uh, reactivate those for you if we want. If sorry, if you want. <laughs> so again, that would just be a case of, sort of working with your account managers and CSMs to uh, to, to basically have that capability, but ultimately we want you to be able to, you know, to control this and, you know, test it at your own pace and ultimately help build your, your confidence with the, the product as well. So I know it's been, it's been mentioned a few times, but I please, I, I do urge you to have a look at the, the resources that we've got as, um, as Gilly mentioned, I'm fortunate to have sort of edu uh, ex educators who help build out these resources and there's some fantastic uh, sort of material in there. Again, these are linked within the AI detection tool itself. So when, as the Namrata mentioned, when you click into the tool, you're able to see these resources and get links to these resources in there. So lots of pedagogical resources, you know, around helping to, you know, around assessments, but also some resources around you know, understanding the false positives and how to, you know, have those potentially difficult conversations with students. So I do urge you to you know, to really familiarize yourself with these and, and, and to understand these. And again, 
uh, you know, when you're reading through them, if you have any questions, reach out to myself, your account managers. Again, we can help you guide guide you through this as, as much as possible. So that brings it to the end of the session and the last from me. So we're going to hand it over now um, for Q&A. So I'm going to take it back to Namrata, who will go through the questions and answer some and also address them to the rest of the panelists. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Lots of exciting questions coming through. Oh, one second, and I did copy them. Yeah, sorry. I think the first one, uh, Ben, you might like to answer this. This come up a couple of times. Uh, can you confirm the slides will be shared? All hyperlinks are not clip clickable through screen share. Yes, we can share out the we can we can share out the the resource. Sorry, do you see the resources? You say. Yeah, basically, they just want to know if the slides and the recording will be shared. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so the the we have a recording. Uh, we'll have a recording like with about a week after the the session, so we get that recording out to you, uh, so you can see exactly what you've seen today. But also, we have our AI landing page, um, which is on the the website, and also linked to some of our signatures as well, so you can get it that way. Again, if you need any help with the resources, just ping uh, your account managers an email, and we can send those resource resources out to you as well. But yes, everything will be shared in the the recording. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Gailene, this one is for you. Can you clarify that? For those that opted out of AI detection, uh, will their papers and student submissions still run through the AI detection service? Yeah, thanks, Nimrod. Um, So yes, so as of April fourth, um, we don't, we just don't show the AI indicator when you when you disable that, or if we've disabled it for you prior to launching the the feature. Um, you won't you won't see it, uh, but we are still processing papers as of the fourth, so that when you do turn it on, or if you enable it for a test account, um, you'll be able to see that that data when it shows up. Thanks, Gaylene. Uh, another one uh, follow up for you: uh, Are there plans in place to allow students to see AI detection score? So we're looking at what the student experience looks like and we're, we're trying to time that with what our student, our updated student uh, similarity report looks like as well. But I think the first step in this is to be able to leverage the PDF download. So when, when we have that capability available, um, we should be able, that should be something that you can share out with students as a first step. Thank you. Uh, Zach, on to you. Does AI false positive show up more frequently with non-native speakers, given that they might lack the broad range of vocabulary, et cetera, in the early years? Uh, we are not seeing that. In fact, we included non-native uh, English content in the training data explicitly. There are open data sources for that. And so we have not seen any indication um, that, that there's bias against a non-native English speaker. Thank you. Another one for you, a uh, paragraph of text. How does Turnitin assess that paragraph of text which has been changed to lyrics or a poem by AI? I'm sorry, how does it assess? How does Turnitin, it? yeah, so I think the question basically is uh, how does how do we assess if uh, a text or, or a paragraph has been changed to lyrics or a poem? Do we still detect it as AI if it's in the form of po a poem? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. We the the uh, I'm going to maybe answer it the, by just describing what we look for when we're doing detection, which is we want prose text. So when we examine a document, we really we really only want to find things that look like fully formed, complete sentences. Right. We want to skip headers. We want to skip titles. We want to skip. Um, you know, data, things like that, that don't really look like actual just text, like sentences. So if there's a poem and it's, you know, maybe not got as much punctuation in it as you might expect from a prose text, we might skip that part of the document because we can't, the detector isn't effective on it. So um, yeah, so I, it's, that's, that's an interesting question. And when you, when you drill in and look at the document level, you can see you know, you'll see the sections of the document where the where we found the AI writing, and I think that would be something to test out. Like, if you put poems in it, is it highlighting them or not? Thank you. Uh, there's one more for you, Zach. Uh, do you recommend a minimum word count for an assessment question so it's easier to detect AI? If so, what would be the minimum word count? 
Yeah, the minimum word count for the document itself is 300 words, or we won't even um, try to process it. I, I believe, uh, Gaylene, you spoke about that earlier. Yes. Uh, ben, there are a couple of questions regarding uh, the guides and manual, uh, you know, the uh, the pedagogical resources that we mentioned during our presentation. So, if possible, can we just share out the link to to the main AI, the landing page, uh, the TLI resource, because uh, this they don't uh, seem to find where where to get these misused guides from. Yeah, that's fine. We can we can share it out. That's that's no problem. We can share out a PDF um, with the slide deck as well after the after the meeting is finished. Thank you. Sorry, with the recording. So you get the slide deck with the, the PDF slide deck with the recording. That's okay. Okay. Uh, the next one is uh, regarding, uh, I, I can take this one. Uh, will AI detection always be included with Feedback Studio or will there be an additional cost for it at some point? So currently we've made uh, AI detection available across a lot of our products, including Feedback Studio, Originality, Similarity, SimCheck, et cetera. But beginning uh, 2024, we are looking uh, to make AI detection available only through uh, Originality and Feedback Studio with Originality. So you'll need to speak to your uh, account managers to understand uh, the next steps on how uh, you, know, you can access the AI feature even in 2024. Uh, there's one on um, a very interesting question on student facing support. Thinking about student facing support, could the detector be used to support student writing, like highlighting to students during the writing process that there may be cause for concern with the writing and signposting so that they can, you know, kind of improve their writing style or uh, look at ways to adapt and support student learning within the AI climate. Uh, the reason I find this question really interesting and I'd like to just talk to it is, is because it's, it's similar to what we do with draft coach. And uh, as while, while we are still developing our AI writing detection, we are definitely looking at ways in which we can use AI writing or, or our, our tool as a more formative tool. We, uh, to be very uh, honest and open, we, we don't have any timelines or, on, on, or, or even the fact on what this feature might look like or what we might be able to do. The, do. But, but given that we really want, uh, you know, to, to use most of our tools to further uh, learning outcomes for students. This is uh, a key area that we definitely will be looking into in the coming months. So stay focused and tuned. We will share details as and when we are able to, uh, you know, go through what, what this might turn out to be. So I, Gaylene, if you want to add something to it. I think the only thing I'd add is we are actually exploring, um, in addition to what Namran has said, other ways we can add uh, large language models or other types of, of capabilities into not only um, you know, our detection capabilities, but also informative um, for instructors as well. So thinking about how we can enhance our grading and um, feedback um, capabilities using AI, as well as, and that's, and that's either before they submit, perhaps during a drafting process or even after. Um, and then we would couple those, always couple those with uh, resources like we have for AI today, um, how to use those, how to have a conversation around how, how to use them um, and what they, what they could potentially mean. But yeah, we, are, we have lots of things in, in um, exploratory mode right now around using AI. Thanks, Gaylene. Uh, I think we're getting a lot of questions on how, um, you know, uh, how our tool may or may not be flagging the use of uh, 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 Grammarly, et cetera, like for when, when students use uh, Grammarly just for grammar checks, et cetera, and then does it get flagged as AI by our detector? Uh, Zach, would you like to answer that? Uh, sure. I'll say that we're in a testing mode right now with a lot of different scenarios. They involve Grammarly and Quillbot, people have mentioned in the chat, you know, a lot of these different things, GPT-4, BARD. Um, the detector itself was specifically built for GPT-3.5. That was the, the main target um, when we developed it. That was, you know, chat GPT had just come out and we needed a solution that addressed that immediately. So that is the focus of that detector. Um, in our in our testing, we are identifying cases where it continues to be effective on other AI writing tools, such as GPT-4. Where you know we we have data sets and we're running them and we're seeing if it still works. Um, with Grammarly, it's a little more complicated because there's a whole bunch of different modes you can use in Grammarly. Same with Quillbot, it's kind of a complicated product, and they aren't nearly those two companies are not nearly as open about releases and staging 
releases the way like a, the, the text generation tools are. Um, but we are investigating uh, both aspects as well, whether whether uh, using Grammarly on human writing is causing our detector to go off or um, whether, what's the other scenario, <laughs> whether using Grammarly on AI generated text, whether we're still able to detect it or not. Um, so that's just an ongoing thing that we're that we're um, checking out right now. Thanks, Zach. Uh, there's another question on, uh, since we spoke about minimum word count, there's also a question on maximum word count. Uh, is there is there a maximum word count that we need to follow for AI detection to work? Did you say a maximum word count? Yeah. Uh, no, it's just a, just the minimum and then however big the submission is, we'll, we'll run to the end. Thank you. Um... So I think uh, I've sort of gone through a lot of questions that I could group together. Is there, if you guys figure anything else that you, you know, I, see popping up? I see, so, I see a lot of questions about prompt. Can you prompt the tool to defeat it, basically? And that's one of the things that we spent a lot of time on the last couple of years was like trying to come up with prompts that'll, you know, like, hey, write, write an essay like a high schooler would. Or if you give it a sample of some writing, say, write, you know, write an essay using this sample of writing as a style guide. Uh, you can even tell it things like include grammatical and spelling mistakes, like, you know, like a, a learner would use. Um, and at some point you can produce text that isn't detectable, but I, I'll say some things about that. One is you have to be really good at prompting. I'm not sure that your average student is gonna really be that adept at prompting techniques. Um, but the result is also not very good writing. <laughs> like you can get it to defeat our detector, but often the result is like borderline gibberish. Um, you know, it, it, either you've it's got so many mistakes in it or, uh, you know, the wording is so unusual that it's like, you know, AI wouldn't generate this because it's not good text. So, um, but that de definitely, you know, we have, we have uh, been engaged in like trying to figure out how students could be using this to try to complete assignments. That's one of the things that we've spent a lot of time doing uh, over the last couple of years. Thank you, Zach. Um, there's one question for you, Gaylene. Uh, is there a plan to remove opt-out for UK institutions or any institution? To remove the, the functionality to opt-out? Yeah, or I guess functionality no, to opt in, opt out. No, that that feature will remain active in the admin console. So wherever you have that, it will still remain live. You'll be able to turn it on or turn it off um, when you have that. So perfect, thank you. And uh, if you can stay with us, uh, basically we are seeing you know that LLMs uh, and all all of these uh, models are developing at a very fast pace. So how does Turnitin plan to keep you know, uh, keep pace with the developments that we are seeing? Like, how, how does our technology develop? It's probably more of a Zach question, but I will tell you that we we do recognize that the, the pace of change is um, faster than anything I personally have ever seen before in technology. Um, and I do think it means that we have to be very conscientious about how often we make changes. Um, we don't just randomly throw things out to adjust to an update um, that we see from OpenAI with ChatGPT, for example. So we, we do take changes that we make to our products very seriously, um, and we test them very rigorously before we put them out in front of our customers. Um, we have, as Zach has alluded to, we have ongoing research and um, exploratory work across a broad range of tools, both um, large language model tools, as well as other kind of, we test against other detectors to validate some of the things that we're seeing. Um, we leverage a great deal of our uh, existing resources, de-identifying them first to make sure that we can also, you know, test and validate the things that we are uh, putting into production. But I think the biggest challenge for us is, yeah, it, and we're not the only ones in this space. Every Everyone who is developing a tool like this or these similar tools um, is challenged to keep up with the, the kind of changes that are happening at the large language model level. Um, I don't know, Zach, if you want to add anything more to that. Uh, no, I well, I, I will add, but I think that, that <laughs> you cover the main premise, which is that we do need to just continually test and try to keep abreast of all the updates. Um, I'll say also we 
it, when a new uh, text generator comes out, like say BARD and students start using it, there's a possibility our current detector may catch it. Um, and that acts as sort of a deterrent, I think, at least for students who might be thinking about using BARD if they know their institution is going to be using Turnitin's AI detector. Um, but in that scenario, we can't, there, there's no new false positives introduced in that scenario. It's only a, it's only a loss in our ability to identify AI writing. So there's not really any jeopardy to students for, you know, given the pace of the new tools that are, that are coming out. It just may give them a little bit of an opportunity to, you know, defeat the detector if they use a new one of these tools. But again, I think that the presence of a deterrence and the possibility it could still work on those text generation tools is pretty strong. Um, I also see I may have been wrong about the length of the document. Somebody said that they've had it confirmed by support. Um, I, I was under the impression it ran through the end, but that's something that I could totally be wrong about. <laughs> uh, Zach, uh, one question for you. Uh, since we've seen submissions come through uh, April until now, uh, have you noticed any particular disciplines with higher AI detection percentages, such as health or law or anything like that? Um, we are we are doing analysis internally, breakdown of uh, positive rates among disciplines. Um, but uh, I don't have that information on uh, with me right now as to which disciplines that might be. Great. Yeah, so maybe uh, what we're also looking at doing uh, from a marketing perspective later on is is working on, on some data points that we'd be able to share externally. So when that maybe we can include uh, a little bit more on, you know, these disciplines, or except if, if there is some uh, concrete evidence against it. So we yeah. keep you posted. Yeah, I, I, I imagine that we will, you know, when we can, when we have something we can validate, we might have these out in a blog post or something out on the on the main website. So that's also a good place to continue to monitor for the most recent updates on our AI technology. Um, there's one more, uh, Zach. How good is Turnitin's AI detector tool to detect content? generated by other ALMs, uh, LLM, sorry, like Bing or BARD? Yeah, again, that's um, under a testing right now. And uh, what I'll say is that we're, you know, we're establishing the testing regime for dealing with this flood of new LLMs. So like right now we've, as I mentioned earlier, we started testing Grammarly and Quillbot and um, GPT-4, and we'll be moving on to other tools as soon as we, you know, continue that testing. Thank you. Uh, Galen, is there a time scale for when AI scores will appear on assignment dashboards rather than just on similarity reports? I don't have a timeline for that yet, but that'll be something as soon as we, um, we have dates for those, we will post those personally. Thank you. I feel like we've gone through a, a bulk of these questions that I could bucket in terms of what, what uh, identities were asking most about. Um, just trying to scroll through to see if there's any that we've missed or we'd like to answer live. I'll just jump in. There's a couple that are spotted there might be uh, more product related about um, any plans to surface the scores within the integrations and if there's any um, plans for it to be included within Microsoft Teams integrations. So yeah, so those are both technically our, our integrations work. Um, we do, I don't have unfortunately a timeline for you at this point when we plan to do that, but yes, that those will be supported. Um, Zach, I think we may have addressed this question while uh, in your how the model works, but there is one question on um, how does uh, our detector detect AI text? Is there a code embedded in AI text that gets detected or is it just the way words are strung together? Maybe you could just uh, sort of refresh that a little bit. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. There's um, some of the text generation companies have talked about watermarking, it's called, where they put in signals in the generated text. Um, those tend to be fairly brittle, 
Uh, well, first of all, they don't really publicize them, so we can't use them if they are doing them. But they're brittle in the sense that if you introduce text or do some slight modification to it, it can break the whole cipher. Um, we are using um, a language model ourselves that basically learns the uh, writing style of GPT-3.5 slash generated text so that we can differentiate it from the writing style of humans in general. So it's just more of an intrinsic modeling statistical model. Thanks, Zach. I, I see that the TFS question has resurfaced, so I'm just going to address it again. Uh, so from starting 2024, um, AI writing detection will only be available uh, as part of originality and if you license TFS with originality. On a standalone TFS license, it uh, won't be available, but you'll have to get an originality license to be able to access AI writing. There's also one question that I, I think is worth um, calling out. Um, I can take it or um, anybody else that's on, on the, uh, the panel might want it. But what link, uh, this question, what link do you have between this product and the ghost writing one, which I uh, assume is uh, talking about authorship? So, oh, so but they're, they're separate products at this point. Um, from a strategic perspective, I could see how there's a value and benefit in making sure that we add these detect detection signals within the authorship capability, but for now they are separate products. Uh, there was one more question uh, that just popped up earlier and I uh, missed it. It was, um, Gaylene, if, uh, so if uh, the customer licenses TFS with originality, is it possible to just see AI writing as part of the originality report and not having to look at it in, via TFS? Yeah, so you can disable it in TFS and enable it in originality. That's not a problem. You don't have to have it show up in both. I have one more question too that I, I saw that this is probably, um, uh, I just wanna make sure Zach, you can validate this for me. As the model develops, does it recheck previously submitted documents or only check against the updated AI model for future submissions? And, it, and in production today is my understanding that we only sort of forward check with each model. We do run background testing and, and validation tests against previously submitted documents, as Zach has mentioned before. But with the production model in production, it's actually just testing or it's actually detecting um, forward documents. Zach, does that, does that make sense? Anything yes. Else? Yeah, we don't do, we don't go back and sweep previous right. documents it just is when we release changes it's just from that point right. onward new submissions get that and it won't and that so that won't change so I, I don't know if the the impetus for asking that question was whether or not the the expected the um indicator percentage to change it should not change because it's not being re um evaluated right you you would have to resubmit it to cause any changes exactly Uh, there are, have been a couple of questions uh, on how do we plan to support the community uh, by training the academics. Uh, so I think a lot of it has been addressed by Gaylene when she was uh, making the presentation and, and pointing you to the resources, pedagogical resources developed, especially uh, to help you guys understand uh, on how AI writing detection works or how to have these conversations with your students, um, use uh, you know, the data and insights we provide to start a formative conversation instead of you know, using it uh, to make a decision for you. So all of that is available and we are planning on building more as we go along and develop uh, the feature even more. Uh, in terms of when you ask, will we be training the academics? I think that onus honestly lies with the university and, and the institutions primarily on how and the policies that they create for you, whether whether you know whether you're allowed or to what extent are AI writing tools uh, allowed to be used in students, you know, uh, assignments. So so a lot of it depends on what policies the institution creates. And based on that, uh, we, you know, we can provide guidance, which we already do, on how our solution should be embedded as a part of your, uh, you know, workflow. So that that's, uh, getting to you, like, want to add something more to that? 
yeah, I just wanted to say though, again, the academic resources, we have hundreds of them on our website and not only for AI, right? It's for, for our plagiarism and, and other things, but with the academic resources that we have both for, um, well, for admins, instructors and students on our website are really great nuggets. They're not you know, super long, they're easy, easily digestible. And I think they're really helpful in thinking about how you put these types of training mod modules together because we have, as I said, um, former teachers, former instructors who are, are thinking about what is the problem that we need to be able to solve and then how do we how do we address solving that and communicating that in these little tight nuggets of information. Um, we also have a several blog posts um, that are related to these types of topics. So again, following our blog is a really helpful way to um, figure out how you can embed or weave some of these knowledge points and knowledge articles into your own processes and, and policies on campus. Thanks, Kayleen. Uh, okay, just to put this, uh, everybody at ease, we are not going to rename any of our products, including uh, authorship. So it remains as originality. And AI writing detection is a feature that will be part of originality. So authorship by itself is a feature within originality, as will AI writing detection. So can I can I also, I want to address the question, there's another question that came in about, so whether we have the license for AI detection or not, the submission data will be used to train the model. Um, no, so we're not actually using submission. We're not actually not in live production. We're not using every submission that comes in to re to train our model at this point. Um, as of July or sorry, as of January 1st, um, we will only be processing documents that are coming in through Feedback Studio or Originality. So if you're a Similarity customer, for example, um, we will not be processing your documents when they're submitted. They will only be processed for those licenses um, that have AI. Thanks, Kayleen. And I think we can take one last question, which says, if you're updating the detection models in flight, how can we be sure that false positive rates are not going to be substantially different to that of the existing model? Zach, would you like to take that? Uh, yeah, um, we would, we engineer it to maintain a low false positive rate. We actually uh, are willing to sacrifice a bit of recall in order to make sure that the false positive rate remains low. And so any future detection, any any future capabilities that we release, we would just be maintaining that level of quality. And to add to Zach's point, we will only release uh, a particular model when we are sure of its accuracy and efficacy. So at no point will that model uh, be accessible to any of our customers if we are not able to you know, uh, live by our objective of keeping the false positive rate uh, as low as possible. Yeah, I mean, we'd rather err on the side of too many false negatives. In other words, not being able, not, not detecting something that it might have been AI written versus, um, you know, detecting something from a student that's handwritten and calling it uh, AI written. So yeah, we, we'd rather err on that side. How are we doing on questions, Namrata? I think we're good. All right. I think we just have a couple of minutes. Should we hand it back over to Ben? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Uh, thanks very much for um, for answering all those uh, all those questions that came through. I think there was one that, that popped up again, which I'll, I'll just clarify um, around the the question around will authors should be renamed to turn it in AI. Um, so in the in the the conversations I've had with um, with some clients recently, um, it's important to realize that originality is a product that already exists um, with additional capabilities on top of your similarity layer. So things like metadata, uh, writing forensic styles, ultimately data points that exist to give um, educators more insights into, into submissions. So that product already exists. And the idea is that um, the AI tools will sit alongside that. So it's not a new product that's been developed for AI. Just that came out in the chat there. I just wanted to, to address that. But yeah, no, I think that brings us, uh, brings us to time. Uh, I'm just looking through no there's no more no more questions in there so yeah thank you very much everyone for um for helping us out with with those questions and thank you everyone for joining us
I hope you found that useful. Like I say, we'll get the recording. Uh, recording should be available within within a week, so we'll get that out to you along with the the slides, so you're able to click uh, for those resources that we've that we've mentioned a few times. Um, like I said, if you have any any questions, you can just follow up with your account manager, and we'll do the best uh, that we can to to assist you with those. So once again, thanks everyone for joining us, and have a great rest of your day. Bye now.